Rocky Smith? Here. Commissioner Adam Morrow? Here. Commissioner Frank O'Donnell? Here. Commission President Denise McGriff? Here. All right, would you uh, join me by standing and uh, let's do the flag salute, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, in liberty and justice for all. Have the national anthem by our singer in the back. <laughs> well, tonight um, it is my pleasure to. Uh, well, actually, let's before we do that, we have some ceremonies and proclamations. And if possible, commissioners, is it all right if I switch uh, 3C and 3B so that 3C follows 3A, uh, which I think would be more appropriate? Is that all right yes. with you all? Okay. You're the acting all right. Mayor. Have at it. <laughs> Well, we haven't gotten to the consent agenda. All right, so as I stated uh, tonight, we have um, four proclamations, or is it five? Let's see, one, oh, we have four, and one award. And uh, it is my pleasure to uh, ask for our community development director to give us a report on item 3A. <coughs> Thank you, Commissioners and Commissioner President McGriff. Um, yes, we have the Ruth McBride Powers Preservation Award. I'm sorry, I had a hard time getting that out in presentation. Um, and the uh, recipients are here and um, ready to receive the, the award. All right. Well, for those of you that are not, uh, we're in our audience tonight and also at home, if you're not familiar with uh, Ruth McBride Powers, every year we have, we've given an award during Preservation Month and we will be reading a proclamation following this uh, award. This year, uh, we're, uh, the award was granted to Haley and Ike McGinnis of 610 John Quincy Adams Street in Oregon City. And I, for one, who also live in the McLaughlin neighborhood, am very proud to see a house that when I was on staff was not designated, but that these people have taken it upon themselves to take this house and bring it back to its former glory. And it would be fantastic and supportive of us to make this award to encourage others who have homes that maybe some incompatible alterations could be reversed. So I would like to, is there, he's gonna come in just a second because he's dealing with the kids. So I would like to call, um, Ike uh, up to receive this award, if you'd like to come up front.
So next we'll move to the uh, proclamation declaring um, May 2022 National Historic Preservation Month. So I'll go ahead and it's a short one. So whereas historic preservation is an effective tool for managing growth and sustainable development, revitalizing neighborhoods, fostering local pride and maintaining community character while enhancing livability, and whereas historic preservation is relevant for communities across the nation, both urban and rural, and for Americans of all ages, all walks of life, and all ethnic backgrounds, and whereas it is important to celebrate the role of history in our lives and the contributions made by dedicated individuals in helping to preserve tangible aspects of heritage that have shaped us as a people. Now, therefore, I, Denise C. McGriff, Commission President of the City of Oregon City, do, pro do proclaim May 2022 as Historic Preservation Month and call upon the people of Oregon City to join their fellow citizens across the United States in recognizing participation in this special observance. In witness thereof, I will set my hand this fourth day of May 2022. So thank you, staff, for all your work in this. And as I said to uh, Haley and Ike, this is something that's near and dear to my heart. Commissioner Smith, would you like to add anything to this at all, since you're my other fellow preservationist? <laughs> uh, well, I, I love this program. And I was a recipient of this award. Um, I knew Ruth Powers as well. And she's someone who Really, I don't think this city would be the same without her. And so having that name continued on and to keep honoring people who are still um, every year and every five years and every 10 years taking on projects to renovate buildings because even though it's done once or twice, it has to have someone else again in another decade doing the same thing to keep these properties um, here. Oh, and thank you. And that project is amazing. And that house is incredible. Yeah. Mr. O'Donnell? Mr. Burrell? So, yes, it's... Um as I, as I said earlier, it is, it is really truly a labor of love and those of us who own historic properties, we're really just stewards for this time and place to take care of it and pass it on to the, to the next generation so that they will be here. My house is over 100 years old and I am just amazed at how resilient it is and how it manages to uh, stand up against houses that are brand new. My windows are original and uh, they still work. So thank you again, staff, for all your work on this preservation program, as Rocky stated. I'm also a past recipient of uh, the Ruth McPriard Bowers Award, and it, it means a great deal to me that, that this legacy of hers is still continuing and, and will continue into the future. So I would like to ask uh, Commissioner Morrow to read um, the next proclamation, which is um, something that he had recommended. It's uh, Asian American and Pacific Islander Her Heritage Month proclamation. So thank you. Thank you, Commission President McGriff. Uh, whereas Asian American and Pacific Islander heritage in the United States was celebrated beginning in 1978 and was made into a month-long event in 1992, and whereas Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month is a month to celebrate and pay tribute to the vast diversity of languages, religions, and cultural traditions of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders that strengthen the fabric of American society, and whereas the month of May was selected as it honors the immigration of the first Japanese residents to the United States in 1843, additionally, May also marks the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad in 1869, constructed by the labor of mostly Chinese immigrants, and whereas Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders have lived and worked in Oregon for more than 200 years, contributing to the state's rich history, economy, and culture. And whereas Asian American and Pacific Islander history in Oregon is marked by a struggle for freedom, equity, and justice, prevailing over the adversity of exclusion, persecution, incarceration, and disparities, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders have helped advance Oregon's prosperity and have a long-standing history of making esteemed, significant cultural and economic and community contributions and whereas the vibrant history and diverse cultures of Oregon's Asian American and Pacific Islanders are here to be honored and respected as a central part of our state, county, and city's story and shared with all Oregonians.
Now, therefore, I, Denise C. McGriff, Commission President of the City of Oregon City, do hereby proclaim May 2022 Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month Proclamation and encourage everyone to commemorate this important occasion in recognition of the numerous contributions by Asian Americans and Pacific Islander communities locally, nationally, and globally. And I will be setting my hand uh, on this document this day, the fourth day of May, 2022. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Commissioner. And now for one of my favorite weeks in the entire year and the month of May, uh, we have a proclamation declaring May 15th through 21st, 2022 as National Public Works Week. Uh, Mr. Lewis, would you like to say anything about this? Well, just the, the work that we do um, touches the community in many ways, many, many ways, and we um, are serious about the work that we do. We approach it um, on a daily basis uh, from many perspectives, and we um, feel like the work that we do is important. We hope you do, too, and we appreciate you taking the proclamation on. And that, thank you. Thank you for uh, bringing this forth. I remember... Uh, when we declared this uh, last year. So I will read this. So whereas public works professionals focus on infrastructure facilities, emergency management, and services that are of vital importance to sustain sustainable and resilient communities and to the public health, high quality of life, and well-being of the people of Oregon City, and whereas these infrastructures, facilities, and services could not be provided without the dedicated efforts of public works professionals who are engineers, managers, and employees at all levels of government and the private sector, who are responsible for rebuilding, improving, and protecting our nation's transportation, water supply, water treatment, and solid waste systems, public buildings, and other structures and facilities essential to our citizens, and whereas it is in the best interest for the citizens, civic leaders, and children in Oregon City to gain knowledge and maintain interest and understanding of importance of public works and public works programs in their respective communities, and whereas the efficiency of the qualified and dedicated personnel who staff the City of Oregon City Public Works Department is materially influenced by the people's understanding of the importance of the work they perform, and whereas National Public Works Week was instituted in 1960 by the American Public Works Association to call attention to the importance of public works in community life, and the United States passed a resolution, excuse me, the United States Senate passed a resolution affirming the first National Public Works Week, and whereas the year 2020 marks the 62nd annual National Public Works Week, and it should be recognized with the theme ready and resilient. Now, I therefore, Denise C. McGriff, Commission President of the City of Oregon City, do hereby proclaim this week, May 15th through 21st, 2022, as National Public Works Week in Oregon City. And it's a long one. Uh, we urge all citizens and civic organizations to acquaint themselves with issues involved in providing public works and recognize the contributions which public works professionals make every day to protect our health, safety, and comfort, and quality of life. In witness thereof, I do hereby set my hand this fourth day of May 2022. Thank you. American Public Works Association this go round. Yeah, this year I'm the president of the Oregon chapter of American Public Works Association. So yeah, we're an 800 member plus member uh, organization. We our last conference was in April, and well, our main charge is to raise funds for scholarships for engineering students. And I think we had just under 300 people at the conference, and we raised over $15,000 for scholarships. We'll do that again in October, so quite an honor. Thank well, you. Thank, thank you for your work in that organization and bringing this to the importance, and thank you, Dana Webb, our uh, official city, city engineer, for all of your work and all of your staff and all the other folks at Public Works. So thank you very much. And last but not least, our last one um, is uh, item 3E. Uh, it is our uh, Star Wars Day proclamation. And uh, I would ask that uh, uh, TIE Fighter pilot Greg Williams come forward to uh, the front of the room along with his staff and other friends. Would you 
like to give us just a little overview, sir? Yes, I would. Good evening, members of the Galactic Senate. My name is Wing Commander Greg. I command the squadron, which uh, keeps patrol over Sector OC in this part of the galaxy. Uh, within our jurisdiction is the Jedi Library on John Adams Street. And I am proud to report that this, uh, the Jedi Library tonight was the scene of an attempted takeover by the evil forces of the Empire. We had stormtroopers, we had TIE fighter pilots, pilots, even Sith Lord Darth Vader made an appearance tonight at the Jedi Library. But I am proud to report that with the support of so many of our youngest Jedi Padawan learners within our community, with our Jedi Masters and Princess Leia helping to arm them and make foam uh, lightsabers, we were able to battle back the forces of evil. And I can report that Sector OC is firmly in control of the Rebel Alliance at this point. And we continue, we foresee that will continue to be for as long as the universe and the galaxy persists. So thank you very much to my uh, esteemed colleagues here. We continue to fight the good fight. Uh, and may the force be with you on this Star Wars day. And with you also. <laughs> so I would, uh, I'm very pleased to be able to uh, read this proclamation. So whereas a long time ago in a galaxy, uh, we should have had the music be queuing here. So <laughs> Chief, are you queuing the music? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's in the charter that that's your part of your job. <laughs> I think it is in the charter. So somebody should really cue the music while I read this. So, whereas a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, the his heroic Rebel Alliance won a great victory against the evil Galactic Empire, and whereas the noble Jedi Knights once hunted to be near extinction by the Sith were able to restore balance to the Force and bring peace to the galaxy, and whereas the residents of Oregon City strive to clear our minds and allow the force to surround us, to flow through us, and to bind us together, lest the power of the dark side seduce us and forever dominate our destiny, and whereas the residents of Oregon City shall remain vigilant against the resurgent empire, first order, <laughs> or Sith, and safeguard against the construction of a third Death Star, the gathering of the new Star Destroyer fleet, or the establishment of a second clone army, I, Commission President McGriff, raise my lightsaber and do hereby proclaim May 4th, 2022 as Star Wars Day and encourage all Oregon City residents to celebrate this momentous occasion. May the 4th be with you. And whereas I do by hereby set my left hand, 1980, <laughs> 980 this fourth day of May 2022 and it's, it says Denise McGriff Commission President and aspiring Jedi Knight <laughs> so may the force be with you and also with you, with you. And also with you as well <laughs> huh. and I do have signed proclamations that I will sign and get get to you so all right, so on to uh, the rest of the not as exciting business. <laughs> Are you still with us, Mr. Mr. O'Donnell? I'm, I'm here. <laughs> All right, uh, we have a presentation on the update of the temporary. Um, oh, sorry, we're citizen comments. Sorry, I skipped that. Excuse me, excuse me. All right, let's back up. So uh, let's take uh, Mr. Burge, who is on the line. Dan, can you uh, can you hear us? Are you zooming in now? Can you unmute, Dan? Oh, there we go. Okay, Hi, Dan. I, I have nothing at this point. I think yeah, most of the changes are... Dan, are... stop for a minute. We can't hear you. Oh, okay, Try. sorry. Can you hear me better now? A better. Okay. Well, uh, uh, okay, say uh, your name again for the record time, and your city of residence. I don't want to waste your guys' time. Dan Burger, Oregon City, Oregon. Uh, uh, I have no comment. Thank you. Yeah, we can sort of hear you, but we have we got your um, your uh, email. So go right ahead. Yeah, I have no comment. No comment. My system's not working. No comment. Thank you, guys. And no comment. His system's not working. Goodbye. Oh, bummer. Okay. Well, we have uh, um, we did receive some correspondence from. Um, from uh, Mr. Bird, so I hope you all had a chance to take a look at that, and uh, we will consider that. So I'd like to call up uh, uh, Bert Thornley.
and welcome to the meeting. I introduced myself to him before the, before the meeting started. Welcome to say your name and your city of residence for the record. I'm Bert Thornley here. I've lived in Oregon City since 92. All three daughters have graduated Oregon City High and college and got two of them back home. They're permanently disabled. My house is filled up. I need to remodel it. I just got retired. I was going to do remodeling myself. I need some temporary storage on my place, and I bought some containers from Northwest Containers in Portland. First time across the ocean, they're brand new. They're not rusty or graffiti, and I've got them in my yard, and I got a letter I can't have them on my yard. But I, they're for temporary storage. I do not want to leave them there after my project is complete. And that's, uh, I've talked with the uh, code enforcement and the uh, city engineer and I, they said to approach this way to see what would happen to get a variance if there is a possibility of a variance or anything for storage containers. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it's something when I'm done with the remodel, uh, they're going to be picked up and gone. They're, and I can put them behind my house where they're not visible from the road. I've got a big lot. I've got 200 foot deep. And, I mean, I don't know what the complaint is about these connexes, but I'm wondering if there is a way to file a variance or any way I can use them or if I have to get them off a property by the 15th and what happens if I don't get them off. <clears throat> There's still some questions. I've asked to talk to somebody face to face, but I haven't been able to really do much other than the, the code enforcement officer here in the building. But it's, uh, so I'm sort of at a loss which way I got to proceed. Well, I'm going to look over at our community development director. Um, do, I can uh, talk talk with the gentleman outside and see where where things are at. I'm not too familiar with this case, but I think I've heard a little bit about it. Okay, that'd be helpful. So perhaps you could give him your card, and then you could make a contact. So this is our community mm -hmm. development director who's. I in, can't hear. Oh, this I'm is our deaf. community development director who's in charge of planning and building, and she is going to um, assist you so she can talk to you um, out, outside to give you some direction on where to go and what to do. Appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mitchell. Oh, okay. Yeah. It doesn't say, oh, okay, it does say 8A. Okay, all right. Is there anybody else uh, in the audience that would like to say something before we move to the next item? Doesn't look like it. Okay. So we're on to the item that I mentioned before, before I forgot about the citizen comments. So we have an update um, on the temporary uh, shower trailer at Milner Veterinary Hospital and Brax, which is new because Brax Laundry just opened, finally. So, Brandy, thank you for coming. Um, would you like to go ahead and introduce your item? Sure. Brandy Johnson, Executive Director of Love One. Uh, so I am reporting back on the status of our shower cart operations, and I'm throwing in a little extra for you all, but I'll keep it brief. Um, between November, when we last reported back, uh, November and April of this year, we provided 130 showers, 111 uh, different individuals received resources and not showers. So 241 folks have been served over the last several months at our shower events. Um, as Commissioner McGriff just mentioned, we did uh, resume operations of laundry in Oregon City now that our one and only laundromat is open again and it is beautiful. And all of the machines work, they do not burn clothes. Uh, and they have indoor bathrooms. So it's actually a really, really lovely facility and the owners are wonderful. Um, and so we're able to offer showers in conjunction with laundry. So we're serving housed as well as unhoused folks. Um, our first event was in March and that was a soft launch. So we didn't advertise that just to get our uh, setup down and see what capacity would look like. Um, we had 23 people who accessed laundry, 39 for hygiene and wraparound supports, and we did six showers. Um, this month, we had our event on the 27th, and I believe we had just over 60 folks utilizing services. Um, 
We're working to bring on additional on-site partners like we do at our Milwaukee events. So we partner with Outside In, we partner with Providence Better Outcomes for Bridges. We have sometimes representatives from Central City Concerns Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion Program um, and a few other partners so that we can connect folks to either housing resources or any of the other things that they're needing to do, um, whatever their next steps are. So we have not received any complaints from surrounding property owners as to the Milner site. Uh, we are working with the businesses that share the parking lot with Brax. It is clearly delineated whose parking spots are, are whose for that area, but it does look like a shared parking lot. Um, so we have made contact with the hair salon. I believe that's the only business that's open about the time that we run our events and they've been very, uh, very willing to work with us. Um, and so we are, working out a different setup so that we're we're a little bit further away from uh, from their parking spots. Um, we continue to build community and relationships with the folks utilizing the services. So that's a continual thing. It's not just at events. Um, we have uh, started to do, I'm gonna, well, we're now running a food pantry. I'll go back to that. Um, out at the Redland Grange, that's on Thursdays every week. So we're serving about 250 individuals on a weekly basis with uh, with food. So fresh food, frozen food, shelf-stable food. Uh, and that's in partnership with Clackamas Service Center. We'd like to increase capacity because we are running out of food after 15 minutes. Um, and it's just it's where we're at with what we can haul. Um, and so we will increase that as quickly as we can, but that's just an idea of the need, particularly in that area. Um, and we do allow, we've gotten several referrals from DHS and the school district asking if they can send staff to come shop for families. And that's an absolute yes, always. Um, so really it's just our ability to increase our capacity to, to try to meet the need. Um, so that's one of the ways we've expanded. Um, I did want to share that we've been doing intensive outreach in Newell Creek. Um, we've also been partnering and have been for quite some time, but with Officer Haynes doing um, doing outreach uh, down by the waterfront and that sort of thing, um, especially post camp clearing, trying to help folks connect to whatever next resources they need. But Newell Creek has been the last probably five, six months. Um, and this is not included in the report that I submitted, but we have four folks moved into transitional housing. We've got five who have a housing voucher in process or in hand. Um, 19 of the folks out there are otherwise receiving services. They just don't necessarily qualify for housing vouchers at this time. Um, but we are working to make sure that they have their ID, their birth certificates, everything in order so that when vouchers become available or they are qualified, we can do that. We're also um, spending time connecting folks with their, many people are already signed up for OHP, but don't know how to access that. So we're scheduling appointments, reminding them about those things, um, making an effort to make sure that folks have phones and consistent service so that once they do make those appointments, they can know what day it is and what time it is and do that. Um, so we're seeing significant impact. It's slow. It's, it's not a quick solution, but it is definitely a person-centered approach um, addressing it at an individual level. Uh, and we've seen a significant increase in uh, folks who have historically not accessed services who are in the canyon, not access, accessing services, and they are now starting to access services. Um, so there's a shift. We're working with ODOT, with Metro, with OCPD, um, with Clackamas County Sheriff's Office, um, you know, because it's, Mill Creek's kind of that weird, ODOT has some, but it's not, you know, a straight line. Metro has some, the city has some. So we're working with all of the different jurisdictions to work on that. And then um, last but not least, so that actually looks like me going out and climbing over logs and crossing the little creek without falling in, uh, in partnership with LEAD right now. Um, but pending some funding that we've applied for, I should know more tomorrow, um, we'll be rolling out an outreach team so that, that can be a consistent um, support. So it won't just be me who can respond. Well, like at the laundromat the other night at 11 p.m. when we had one of our folks in a crisis, uh, and OCPD was phenomenal. Um, and we were able to partner together to transport that person somewhere safely. Um, and it could have had a much different outcome. So. 
really my, my goal is to provide additional support so that in those situations when it's, um, that was definitely uh, an appropriate time to call the police, but there are other times when that is not the best use of that resource. And so we wanna be able to offer assistance in those situations. And so that is my, my next step project. Do you have any uh, questions of the commissioners or comments? I did have one. So I know that they have a uh, food program through the Oregon City Farmers Market. Are you connected up with them at all to get, you know, the vouchers or get the, some of the, you know, because I'm assuming some of these folks have children and they have that program where the kids get a certain amount of um, yeah. the special coins and then they can Little go tokens. shop. But yeah. they also have some for families as well. Mm -hmm. Um. I know that when we took the shower cart up there, I did talk with them, but we're not, we have not connected our food pantry with that. So that's a great suggestion. Okay, all right. Uh, gentlemen, I was gonna suggest that um, we look at um, uh, continuing to support this and maybe have them come back in a, in a year as opposed to every six months. with no complaints yes and that's good job of reporting um, do we need a motion on that there's consensus i think okay that's all right so unless we see you sooner we'll see you officially back um, next may okay all right thank, thank, you, thank so you so much we thank really you. appreciate it great report very thorough all right gentlemen let's move on to the um can adoption of the agenda uh, do you have anything you want pulled from the consent agenda? It looks like they're all meeting minutes. Uh, <laughs> I move to approve the consent agenda. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded to adopt the agenda and approve the consent agenda. Would you do the roll call, please? Commissioner Adam Morrow. Aye. Commissioner Frank O'Donnell? Aye. Commissioner Rocky Smith? Aye. Commission President Denise McGriff? Aye. Motion passes. All right, so moving along to item 8A, uh, we have the first reading of ordinance number 22-1001, the Housing Choices Code update. These new code numbers are just long. GLU 22-0002-LEG 22-0001. So I believe where we left this was there was um, some questions and a request for some visuals. As I recall, um, Commissioner Smith was one of the ones as well as I seconded that. So um, Ms. Aquila heard Ravage. Take it away, please. Thank you. Um, that timing worked out well. It did. Um, <laughs> thank you for helping him. Sure. Um, so yeah. Um, Christina Robertson Gardner, our senior planner, is here to present the uh, first reading of the ordinance. She has a presentation and um, some visuals to address some of the questions from your last meeting. Thank you. At the last meeting, the staff provided additional inspiration about um, garage housing options, cluster housing. I have this on, sorry about that. As well as uh, the duplex, triplex, and quadplex configurations, the question being, uh, is there consensus to allow some detached duplexes or triplexes when there's an existing house as part of the project? Uh, so staff has prepared some uh, compliance and alternate options of code that are in the red line packet. So this evening, if the city commission can provide directions on some of those outstanding questions, I have both options in the red line. And with the um, motion for the adoption of the first reading, you can provide that direction. I can come back for the second reading and have the revised version. So I have everything in the code uh, packet tonight if you want to move forward with either the compliance option or the alternative option. The uh, House Bill 2001 was adopted in 2019 and it requires 
uh, large cities, so cities over 25,000, to adopt code that allows duplexes everywhere that single family detached dwellings are allowed, and create code that allows triplexes, quadplexes, townhomes, and cottage clusters in areas that allow single family dwelling, as well as uh, a permit division, permits division of lots uh, developed with middle housing. That's the middle housing land division. The tools staff used over this year was the Oregon administrative rules that were created to implement House Bill 2001, as well as a model code that was created out of that process. The model code sometimes goes above and beyond the Oregon administrative rules, but we looked at both of them as options as we move forward. A lot of the uh, code revisions in your packet are really dictated by those OARs and House Bill 2001, but there are some opportunities for the Planning Commission and City Commission to provide direction. So as part of the Planning Commission review process, we uh, identified those policy questions and the Planning Commission reviewed them and provided those recommendations. This is an exhibit in your packet that you see the Planning Commission recommendations. At the last meeting, the City Commission wanted additional information, as I said, on two of those policy questions. One, uh, when to allow detached units and more information about attached or detached garages and cluster homes. So, as I mentioned, let me move forward on my presentation, sorry. Uh, the garage options were broken up into two separate code sections, one related to detached garages, when are they allowed, and attached garages. If there's no consensus on any of the um, uh, additional option, uh, additional option, code policy, staff recommends that the city commission retain our existing code for those policy questions and revisit the, uh, the issue in the fall and we'll be coming back to the planning commission. So right now we have code in our existing city um, municipal code that addresses these three issues. So if you wanna move forward more than is required by House Bill 2001, you may, and I'll lay out those three policy questions uh, this evening. So the first one, uh, when to allow detached units as part of middle housing. Uh, in your packet, there's a compliance option we call 1A, which is to continue to require all units and duplexes and triplexes and quadplexes to be attached or a modified alternative option, which was kind of, which was uh, directed by the city commission at the last meeting that allows duplexes and triplexes to include detached units if the existing house is included as one of the units and continues to require quadplexes to be attached. Staff heard that there was um, real differentiation between quadplexes being closer to cluster homes than duplexes or triplexes. So with option B, if you have an existing single family house and you wish to retain it, but add a duplex or triplex as part of your process, you're allowed to have that as detached. If you demolish your house or you have a vacant lot, your units would have to be attached. So that's the only time you're allowed to have detached units either a detached duplex or detached triplex is when it is involved retaining the existing house on site. And that is option 1B. Option 1A continues our existing code that requires all middle housing units to be attached. So you'd have to attach onto an existing house or demolish the house and build a new uh, attached middle housing project. The next policy question relates to detached garage options. And so in our code today, you're allowed to have up to a 600 square foot detached garage structure that's exempt from allowed gross floor area and footprint limitations. And this was really set up to allow kind of shared parking garages and maybe a parking area as part of the cluster homes. The option to be the alternative option uh, specifies kind of two ways to do that. One, continue the 600 square foot detached garages as a shared option and put in a kind of a shared parking area, but also allows a 400 square foot detached garage in conjunction with an individual cottage. I'm gonna show a layout of this. So in this situation, you can kind of see both versions and uh, these are, tried to be drawn to scale, but these are really just illustrative. You'll see in the top left, a 600 square foot shared garage where you might have three uh, parking bays of 20, uh, 10 by 20 parking spaces in one shared garage. And then you might see a 400 square foot 
individual detached garage that an individual cottage home would use. So the option 2B would allow both of these scenarios you see in your screen. I guess the, before you get away from that, so sure. what is the little appendage on the side? Is that supposed to be a porch? Sorry, I'm going to go back. Yeah, that's supposed to be a porch. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what I thought it was. Mm -hmm. So I guess, I guess my question is, is, okay, so we have the closest thing that I could go look at to something like this is, the, is I presume, the townhouses that are on South End Road. They're at the corner of South End and is it Lawton. Their garages are in the back, but they're... They're enough for like a one car garage. I mean, they're bigger than a little bit bigger than two. 200 square feet to me is a, is a shed. I don't know how you get a car in a shed unless you've got a little mini, mini Cooper or one of those little electric cars. People park in two, two. I just am approving an apartment complex today that's using that. Yeah, two, but 10 you, know, by you can't days. get those Avalons or whatever those <laughs> car, trucks are and those type of things. So are we talking about a 600 square? Square foot building that has individual bays that are separated. Yeah, it would have it would have individual shared, so it'd be shared, so there'd be more than one parking. Like space. three garage doors, but you'd open, but you wouldn't open up one big garage door, and three Correct. cars would be parking in it. Okay. Yeah. And that's our code today. So this is saying we would not be changing our code today, or we'd specify <clears throat> that 600 square foot is shared garages and 400 square feet is for individual. That's the option B. And and the picture is I which is the one that's option B. So option B shows both versions. So oh, a 600 okay. square foot shared and a 400 square foot detached, which would be associated with a specific unit. And I'll go back to the code language. So 2A is our existing code, which continues to allow up to a 600 square foot detached garage structures be exempt. And that was kind of intended to be in a shared parking area. Uh, the alternative option is to specify that 600 square foot detached garages are permitted only when shared and uh, allowance of a 400 square foot detached garage in conjunction with a specific unit. Well, one of my concerns is, and maybe you can address this, is I don't want to see a, and I'll use the, the technical term, a herking garage that's bigger than the cottage unit. I mean, that makes no sense to me. And I think in terms of scale, it doesn't, it doesn't give the appearance that it's a cottage thing. You've got this little cottage and then you have this gigantic garage. So how does that square with our requirements that we have about, you know, garages being in the back, being sort of, um, what's the word I want, subservient to the, sure. to the main building, that type of thing? Well, that's not a requirement for... Well, no, I'm just yeah. saying. So this is really a piece where both options meet House Bill 2001. Both options are really to the discretion of the city commission and what they want to move forward. Or is this a policy you want to pursue uh, as part of um, our uh, introduction of more middle housing into the community? Or is this something that you are not ready to pursue or don't feel that that's a priority for the city or want to revisit in the fall? So if there is not consensus for any of these options, I do recommend the use the compliance option and revisit the issue in the fall. But there are both options comply with House Bill 2001. Thoughts at this point? I'm a minimalist. Compliance and revisit. And I have, I have one more slide, okay. one more policy. Right. So That's the, just before we forget what we were yeah, thinking about. Yeah, and I have a nice chart at the end that will okay. help you. Uh, the last is attached garages as part of the cluster, cottage cluster. So House Bill 2001 and the OARs do not require cities to uh, exempt attached garage as part of the footprint. The model code does, but some, this is exactly one of those cases where the model code went above and beyond the minimum compliance. So both options, once again, meet House Bill 2001. Our current code says you can have a 200 square foot uh, attached garage, but it's counted as part of the footprint of your cluster housing. Alternative option 3B says you can have a 200 square foot attached garage, but it is exempt. It is not counted as part of your cluster housing footprint. Both options meet the requirement. Uh, it's really the discretion of the city commission. I know the planning commission for this one uh, they did indicate that there was support for allowing more attached garage units, knowing that um, 
a definite demographic that's interested in cluster homes are people who want to age in place or maybe uh, um, are empty nesters and want to step down into a smaller unit and are looking at attached garages. And that was what the, that was really the direction the planning commission gave. But once again, both options comply with House Bill 2001. So I'll show this. This is an example of a project that Elizabeth Decker, our um, consultant, had. And this is an example of what a footprint of a, a cluster home with a, with a rear attached garage might look like. And so kind of the, the appendage next to the driveway is that 200 square foot uh, attached garage in conjunction with a cluster home. So we're not looking at these, I mean, I guess one of the comments that I heard from the last time was that there was a concern, and again, we can't anticipate everything. People would take that and turn it into some sort of a, a unit. Well, it, it would not be counted. So you'd have to be, if you're a garage, you couldn't come back and uh, turn that into a unit because okay. you wouldn't be in compliance with your requirements. Okay. So you'd have, or you'd have to show you were yeah, like okay. undersized. All right. and you so still it's, met it's the not something that. We've already anticipated that, and so it's, yeah. You, you, at all times, you still have to show you're in compliance, compliance. with okay. the cluster housing standards. All right, now that we're all totally confused, um, comments. <laughs> so I, I have two more slides, and then I'll go back to the, uh, the chart and your memo. So uh, if you can provide direction this evening, we will come back for a second reading at the next meeting. And at that point, the City Commission will remand this package back to the Planning Commission for their October 24th planning commission hearing where they will look at additional policy questions and they will we will legislative this legislative file will be continued and just like the public works adoption project we did a couple years ago there might be multiple packages that get adopted out of this larger legislative file and so uh, I'm curious about garages when you build a garage are you allowed to put a bathroom in a garage Yeah, it's not a dwelling area. So, so the key thing once is... Once you put a bathroom in a garage, it's easily convertible to a dwelling area. This is one thing our building permits look at all the time when people are taking uh, unhabitable space and turning it into habitable space. They will bring it through planning review and we will check to see if they're still in compliance. And there are times when we've said, this looks like you're adding an extra dwelling unit or this looks like you are adding something we need to know more. So something like that, if you're getting a plumbing permit, you'll be brought through the planning and building review process. So you would prevent someone from plumbing a garage for a bathroom? Well, we'd, we'd, we'd verify that it's still staying in a garage and it's not turning into a habitable space. How are you going to do that? I mean, if you allow them to plumb for it, even if they don't put the, the hardware in there and they come back at a later date, they can convert it to a habitation. I think my answer, and of course, I'm not the building official or the building department. We can only review what we are brought in front of us, and we do the best we can to identify when something is in compliance or not in compliance with our code. And we coordinate with our building division when plumbing permits and other permits are brought in. I honestly say I'm not confident in that. I mean, if someone wants to circumvent the law and the codes, they're going to do it. I mean, that's, that's, that's the well, fact the of the matter. The first doing it is plumbing it, whether you install the fixtures or not. Once you plumb it, you can install the fixtures at a later date. Sure, and a neighbor will call in. I mean, that's how we end up seeing a lot of these is either through a request on yeah. a sale for permits pulled, of which there would be none. Um, a, a neighbor complains or calls in with a concern that, you know, interior remodel work is happening without permits so yeah you're right if if it's plumb yeah they could easily do it at night sure. and over the weekend and unless someone called it in or we had to go do an inspection on it that would catch it at that point the other thing that troubles me about this is i am adamant about recognizing covenants and restrictions that prevent the addition of these buildings on lots and i i personally feel that staff should draw those, should survey those covenants and restrictions. The other alternative where staff is pushing back, not wanting to do that, is you clearly post on both the application and the site of the application that determining if these buildings are allowable 
is the responsibility of the applicant. And man, that needs to be on the application and it needs to be in a big, bold placard at the application site. Otherwise, we're going to be in a world of trouble. And that is my absolute plan is to have a big call out box on the front page of the of all middle housing applications. That is the responsibility of the applicant. I guess I'll have to live with that. I don't have to live with it, but that's, that's my thought. <laughs> So just real quickly, and I can go back to the policy questions. Go ahead. Uh, the two, new, two additional things are going to happen. Once again, the, the, the second reading of the ordinance will remand it back to the Planning Commission. And we are currently looking uh, at our middle, middle housing land division. If there needs to be a new fee, we could put it in with a subdivision fee. We could identify it as a separate fee. And cluster housing uh, used to be part of the site plan and design review chapter, but it can't use that fee now. So we'll be coming up with a cluster housing review fee and that'll be coming in front of you before June 30th. So I have this, uh, if you can read this, this is from the um, memo packet. It's the last page that looks at the three options. So with your deliberation uh, and with the motion, if you can provide uh, which, uh, of the three policy questions, which options you want to pursue, uh, we can implement that in the second reading of the packet. Oh, and I know we do have public comment oh, this do. evening too. Yeah. We got, um, I don't need to read that. The summary is that. Isolating garages, square footage uh, 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 for a garage for a cottage. We're getting the uh, not to be deducted from the square footage of the cottage because he's talking about appraisers basically don't calculate the garage and that a majority of elderly people want a garage. Well, okay. Uh, Mike, do you want to come on up? Staff comment on the purchase letter. Um, we'll we'll get to it after yeah. we get done with uh, Mike. Sorry, my notes are on here, and it just flipped the wrong way. Um, <laughs> good evening, you Commission President, upside, Commissioners. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for letting me speak to you this evening. My name is Mike Mitchell. I'm an Oregon City resident. And just to be clear, I am a member of the Planning Commission, but I'm speaking for myself tonight. And on the, oops, they went off the screen. But on those three items, um, I would encourage you to go with the alternative option on all three. Um, on the detached duplex issue, a uh, du duplex or triplex, the Planning Commission voted to allow those in any condition. But I believe that the intention of that was to encourage the preservation or allow the preservation of existing homes. So this alternative option does that. Um, if you're not comfortable with uh, detached duplexes in any situation, uh, understandable, um, but to allow it in a situation where an existing home uh, can be saved, I, I think is a, a good thing for our city, specific, specifically in the historic neighborhoods. Um, as to the cottage home garage issues, um, they're kind of tied together, and I would encourage the maximum flexibility there. As Ms. Robertson Gardner said, um, cottage homes are attractive as a more affordable option in some cases uh, done properly, and also uh, are very attractive and aging in place. And most people do want to have a detached garage. Uh, so I would encourage maximum flexibility on garage. And of course, it's going to be different depending on the site and how, uh, you know, what, what works. And there may be a mix in a development. Some houses might have a detached garage. Some might have an attached garage. Um, but to allow that flexibility could help make cottage houses, housing more attractive. And for another important reason, one of the things that we saw very clearly in the community community survey uh, that was done on these topics was the concern over on-street parking. And I know that comes up very, very often. And so to allow more options for off-street parking in a cottage development uh, will go a long way toward the community desire to make sure that in these missing middle situations um, that, how, that uh, parking is not driven onto the streets. 
So I would encourage you to go with the alternative options on these three items. And, and uh, thank you for your support of what the Planning Commission did. Um, nice to be listened to. We, I know you have some small differences, but, uh, but in general, uh, supportive of what the Planning Commission did. And I thank you for that. Thank you. Don't run off, Mike. Yeah, don't run off. Okay. So you're in favor of the 600-foot uh, freestanding garage to service multiple dwellings? I would be in favor of allowing that as an option, yes, because there may be site considerations where, you know, I think one of the key features of, of a cluster housing uh, is that common area in the middle and what can be done with that to generate community. And there may be situations where having an attached garage doesn't work as well as having a detached garage, say, uh, across a rear, rear alley or whatever, so that in, in the main portion of the housing, there uh, there are no vehicles at all and, and no parking at all. And it, it's just, good. it'll depend a lot of times on the site, but I think to allow it as an option would be a good thing. And then I recall that we had a pretty lively discussion on duplexes and triplexes having by nature a shared wall. Did you want to consider them both duplex and triplexes, although they're each freestanding? We had that same discussion uh, yeah. uh, at, at the planning commission and uh, not to minimize your concern, but I would suggest maybe don't get too hung up on, on call, uh, calling it a duplex. It's two, un it's two units on a, um, what terminology we're we using parent and child lots, two separate units. Um, I don't know the details on this, but uh, I know that when you, uh, when you have a duplex, there are some additional considerations. That common wall can't just be a normal two-by-four stud wall. There's right. fire code that gets involved, so there's extra cost to that. Right. So, again, there may be situations where detached could allow a project to go forward, where attached is uh, unworkable because of the site, because of the cost of connecting them, because in my opinion, it's going to be very difficult to put, wow, sorry, yeah, just maybe to, to put a new unit onto an older home. Uh, you know, visually, that, that can be a struggle. So again, it, it's allowing the option. And, and I think where the Planning Commission came down was it, it, it was not to get too hung up over duplex. Maybe we need a new word. A new well, term. I recall the conversation was when does a duplex or triplex become a cluster home for lack of a shared wall? The um, state uh, definition is a number of units, right? 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 Yeah. Pardon? It's four units, four or more mm -hmm. units becomes a cottage cluster. And less than four units is small houses. Distinction escapes me. It, it, it's a, it's a tough one because because when you look at them, they're going to look the same. And how is that different than say uh, a house with an ADU? Is that different? Although in that case, it's two houses on one lot compared to two separate lots. In my opinion, it, it is, and it's an ADU. It, I mean, when does it, when is a duplex not a duplex? You know, when it becomes something else. When it's freestanding. So it's a, it, it, it's a housing type, and maybe we shouldn't be calling it a duplex. I don't have a great suggestion right offhand. But it's a, it's a separate small home on a child lot, according to the alter, missing middle alternative option. Yeah, well, I, I can't. I can't kick me if I'm getting this wrong. I can't get past the duplex <laughs> thing. It's, it's, a dupl it's a duplex, you know? That's what it is. If, if they're unless, connected. Unless it's, you know. Is that, are you, you're saying it's only a duplex if they're connected? That's, that's been the traditional definition, and that's the only one we have. I mean, either that or it's, it's a townhouse, which you have multiple units. I mean, if you think about the development that was approved on uh, Holmes Lane, they've got a series of duplexes that are freestanding, and then there's another duplex, but there's, they're, not, they're not four of them all together. There's two of them here. There's two of them here. There's some triplexes, but again, they're all attached units, but they're separate externally. These 
And so, you know, that could be considered probably, I don't know if it's a cluster housing, but again, it either it is as it is, it isn't, you know? So we're either gonna call it what it is. I, I don't wanna make something up. This is very similar to the discussion we I'm had. I'm sure it is. That we that's, had why we're that's why we're struggling <laughs> with it. <laughs> but I think, again, I think the bottom line for the planning commission is to allow the option in a case where uh, it's impractical to connect the two units or where the property owner doesn't want to connect. Well, then they can the come in and ask for an exception then. There's, there's always ways to modify sure. something. So when we're talking about allowing the option for this, are we just talking strictly about duplexes and triplexes, not quadplexes? Yes, correct. The way that the red line code is written, it's separated out quadplexes, because that's what I heard at the last meeting, that, you, that there was a feeling that quadplexes were more akin to cluster Something homes. Else. And the, the code as it's written as the option is that when there's an existing house, and that's defined as a house that's been there for at least five years, uh, you can have detached, the, the additional units can be, you can have detached duplexes or triplexes. So those additional units can be detached. Uh, and that is a way to, to, as an option, as I think Mr. Mitchell is examining, to uh, incentivize the preservation of the existing house rather than demolishing the house and building kind of a by right fourplex or by right threeplex. I think another way to possibly think about it, I think, Denise, you, Commissioner, President McGriff, you probably remember yeah, how structured zoning was. R10 had to be 100 foot by 100 foot, right, each lot, you know, to get to your 10,000 square feet. And, you know, and so what that led to was a lack of diversity in housing types throughout subdivisions, right? And, and as that discussion has changed over the decades, you know, it's become, is it, is it, is it important to have, you know, an R10 section, an R8 section, an R6 section, and there can be no commingling of lot sizes, housing types, housing sizes, right? And there's been a move to try to integrate that so that you have different equity and income levels, price points possible within a community that you're building. And I don't know if this helps, but the, you know, think of it in terms of units per lot rather than a housing type per lot, right? I mean, that'd be the one, because I understand, I mean, we've got the old school definition, triplex, duplex, has to have a common wall. And that's just historically been a duplex. It's just been known that it's one building with, with two units in it with a common wall, whether that's a townhouse on separate lots or uh, two units on one lot in the, in the form of a duplex. And so I guess really the question is, you're getting two units on that lot. You know, does it, it, do, do they need to be connected in order to achieve our goals? But I agree, it's a, it's a very, very different design concept than we've historically known, defined, or used in our zoning code. One more, one more thought on that, if I, if I, is that okay? Currently, if, if my lot is large enough and I can abide with the setbacks, I can come before the planning commission or come before the city and subdivide my lot into three pieces and build two new houses on the other two chunks. This is that same process. Gosh, I'm really sorry about that. This is that same process, but using the expedited land use division that missing middle housing, the HB 2001 allows for. It's the same process that somebody could do now and subdivide their lot, but they don't have this in this process. They don't have to go through the subdivision process. They go through the expedited land division process. Mr. Smith, any thoughts? If it's confusing, you can just say so. I mean, this is not, this is not cut and dry. No, I, excuse me, I'm losing my voice. Uh -oh. um, I agree with the duplex conversation for sure. Well, what direction are we giving staff on number one here? We're duplex, triplex, and quadplex configurations. I, I will say this, that I did a little reconnaissance about a couple of weeks ago, 
and there are some cluster housing developments in Portland and I will honestly tell you I wouldn't say that those are affordable <laughs> they're well over 500 and something thousand for those um, so HB 2001 is not a housing affordability bill. No, I know bill. it isn't. It's definitely not. <laughs> it's the, we're attempting to say that it is, but I don't know really how that works in reality. Well, what do we want to tell them? Tell them. I'm not willing to change definitions. I, I just don't want to redefine something as something other than it's been. I understand what Mr. Mitchell is saying, but I'm not willing to do that. So you're saying, number 1A, to continue to allow to require, require to units to be duplexes or triplexes, they have to be attached. Yep. I'm not saying they have to be, we're not saying, I think we're not saying here that they have to be attached to the existing house, because I think that would be weird. No. It doesn't work. They, they would have to be they attached would. to the existing house. That's the whole demolition argument that Commissioner yeah, well, Mitchell I, was I bringing think, up. I don't think they should, be, should have to be attached to the existing house. No. Well, then that's 1B. So do you guys understand well, can, that? can they not build a duplex separate from the existing house on the same lot, but all the letter requires a subdivision? The expedited. Go ahead. Uh, the way 1A is saying, if you have an existing house and you want to add more units, those are attached to the house. Unit two and three are attached to the house with the common wall. Or it's demolished. Could you or it's not... demolished and you build a new, a new... If you've got that much room, could you not subdivide the lot and build a duplex freestanding i mean we're talking about if you want to add more housing you've got to attach it to the house i don't if you want to keep your house and you want to add more units if you go with 1a you have to attach those units to the main house that exists today and i'm asking why you can't subdivide the lot and essentially you're doing an adu or you're doing a, a duplex behind your existing You've subdivided the lot. You've accomplished the building of a duplex and without attaching it to the house. Well, you, if you, so if there's two pieces. Subdivision is the process by which you have more land than your zone. So if you're R6, you would have a 12,000 square foot lot. You can subdivide and you have new, a brand new buy right lot where you can do all the uses. The middle housing land division, if I added unit two and unit three to my existing house, and they, they weren't on top of each other, they were next to each other on the ground. You could do a middle housing land division that separated those as child parcels and sell them. But if you go with 1A, those new units have to be attached to the existing house. So you'd have to find a way to attach those new units yes, in the back to the existing house. What you want is to preserve the existing house, which is 1B. Whatever. Um, okay, so it sounds like consensus on 1B. I would be inclined to go with the Planning Commission's recommendation. Yeah. Okay. All right, so let's hit this number two. So this garage option, the, I will say the one thing that bothers me is on 2A, it says it's presumed to be shared. Well, it either it is shared or it's not shared. So why are we saying presumed? That's with our existing code. So the option 2B would be to clarify that. Is that going to and then required? Add, no, it's not required. It's, it, it's our existing code. It's complies no, with HB 2001. The 2B. 2B is not required. Okay, so you're saying somebody could be in a cottage, cottage cluster and have a 600 square foot garage it's with a, a smaller house? Right now it's saying you could have, in our current code, saying you can have a 600 square foot detached garage. It's, in a perfect world we would have an extra sentence that indicated that was for shared parking. And that's what option 2B does. But it also allows a 400 square but foot. But it doesn't say that. It doesn't say that it's required to be shared. Right, 2A is our existing code. No, I'm talking about 2B. You said in a perfect world it would no, be shared. No, 2A. So it says 600 share, share, so that's gonna be a requirement. Yeah, so okay. here, I, can I, see, I see that it says shared, so I just want to yeah. say that's required. Yep, so okay. 2B clarifies that the 600 square feet has to be shared. If, we, if the city commission wants to stay with A, we'll probably come back and clarify that in the fall, that, that it's a shared. Your pleasure, gentlemen. There's no pleasure in it for me. I, I know, I know. Okay, so what do we want to do? I'm okay with 2B. 
Me too. Be or not to be. I'm not the only person voting up here. Not only do we have Star Wars tonight, but we have Shakespeare. So we're, <laughs> we're moving right ahead here. We're, we're very, we're very cerebral commission. That is the question. That is the question. Okay. All right. So we have two for, I'm, I'm, I'm leaning towards 2B. Fine. Okay. All right. Last but not least, three, attached garage options for cluster units. Continue to allow attached garages for individual cottages up to 200 square feet, but count towards the allowed unit size. Keep the 200 square foot limit for attached garages, but exempt them from the unit side allowed in addition to. That's where we need the response to the gentleman's letter. Is that included in square footage or not? And that's the two options. So, I mean, I... I think one of the things that I appreciate and support with the townhouses we have on South End and the ones on Lawton is that the garages are in the back. So your first thing that you're seeing for a development, you're not seeing like a garage door, which I think is, you know, yeah, is optimal. And so your your example, you get to that page where you show the garages in the back. I, I think we want to, you know, we want to continue to encourage that. I. The one picture here from this thing in, in uh, Sisters, that, I mean, that really didn't do anything for me. You got your, it says it's a cottage scale development, but it doesn't kind of look cottage scale. It's got a Herkin garage right there. So, and, and then you've got a unit that, that's, that's huge. And it says potentially with rear alley access, so. I think Mr. Mitchell clarified in saying when you're doing these cluster developments, you're kind of wanting to have that. That's what the ones I've seen in Portland. They have that common area. It's not all about a lot by lot development with the garage in the front. And you know, you're not going to get a whole lot of community that way if everybody's clicking their garage door openers and going in. And that's the end. That's how you, see, you don't see it anymore. Nothing in that prevents that 200 square foot garage from being the, the face of the building, right? Which is your objection? Yeah, I, I, I like. I, I think the one that uh, she put in the packet is, is you know, I think. I know when I was doing working on the South End concept plan, that was something that we had envisioned as a group that we could have developments like this with rear access, and it would be, it would make it kind of unique and different. Because we were looking at areas that were constrained. You know, I think the situation that you talked about with the detached, detached, I think if there's some exception, there's something going on with the property where that could occur, to me, that that would allow for that exemption. But I, just do it kind of. The, uh, the front of every cottage has to face, face the common area. So by right, by de facto, your garages are going to be to the side or the rear. because. Your garage, the side or the rear? Your garage can't also face the face common the area. Front. It yeah. just it can't actually happen because you can't drive into a common area. So the view from the street is a garage the and the back of the be, house. It could be many different things from the street. So I think, as what Mitchell said, is your uh, your cottages are, are, are facing into the sure. common area and then your garages are kind of put where they can. And they very well could be put on the outside. Yeah. Thoughts? The old people, older people do not like getting wet. They want their garage so they can go from their house to their garage and not have to be out there in the rain. But most people don't like to get wet with yeah. their stuff. So I won't even say this applies to older people. It's just people in general. Because I don't, I don't want to see where there's a detached garage and then somebody tries to build a little breezeway across, which then makes it attached, so that it defeats the whole purpose of having a detached garage. And we've seen that. Oh, yes. I know we've seen that in Oregon City, and I don't understand it. Yeah. All right, so we're going with 3A, 3B, or are we creating something completely different under 3C? You want to keep the um, 200 square foot limit, but exempted from the unit size. I think that's how houses are traditionally measured, is it not? A 
but the garage space is not considered part of the living space. Well, it's not supposed to be, as you noted. <laughs> I'd be inclined to go with the planning commission direction. The entire purpose, even though I may disagree with certain parts of HB 2001, is to expand choices for people. And so I would prefer to go with option 3B. Give the most flexibility. So we're talking uh, 100, is it 10? 200 square feet is 10 by 20. 10 by, 10, by tw 10 by 20. Okay, well, 20 is long enough to get most cars in, except for those. Well, your truck wouldn't fit in one, but. <laughs> no. Okay, sounds like you've got a consensus. So I think with the motion, um, the person putting the motion can add, identify with the policy direction of 1B, 2B, and 3B, it sounds like. That's what it sounded like to mm -hmm. me. And that can be just part of the motion this evening. Okay. All right. Uh, we need a motion. I move to approve the first reading of Ordinance 22-1001 and continue the file. Oh. Yes, and continue the file to the May 18th, 2022 City Commission hearing for the second reading with the options of 1B, 2B, and 3B. Is there a second? Second. Roll call, please. Oh, I'll first read the reading. Oh, sorry. Ordinance number 22-1001, an ordinance adopting amendments to Oregon City Municipal Code, Title 16, Land Divisions, and Title 17, Zoning of the Oregon City Municipal Code. Commissioner Rocky Smith. Aye. Commissioner Adam Morrow? Aye. Commissioner Frank O'Donnell? Well, because I don't like the state doing what they're doing, I'm going to say no. Not that it matters. Well, Commission President. Oh, yes, Commission thank President. You. I, I agree with what Commissioner Morrow said. I, there are many parts of this bill that I do not support, but I will work a vote in favor of this motion. Motion passes. Thank you for that. All right, so we're on to general business item 9A. We have a personal services agreement with Wallace Engineering for inflow and infiltration program management. And uh, in light of, thank you, Christina, in light of uh, it, Public Works Week coming up, <laughs> this is a good tee off for that. Well, Dana's going to present to you tonight, so I'm just going to turn it over to our city engineer, Dana Webb. Uh, you don't hear from her very often, so um, welcome, Dana, to tonight's commission meeting. And it does have to get a little closer. This is a project that she's been actively participating in, so it's appropriate for her to present. Dana, can you turn your mic on? Good evening, commissioners. I'm here tonight to um, give you an overview of the inflow and infiltration program management. So um, I've got a, a small agenda. I'll talk through why program management, um, our process for requests for proposals, a consultant selection process, um, the program management team selected, an implementation timeline, and then um, sharing with you the annual reporting back to the commission. Uh, for program management, we selected this method um, to allow us to deliver more projects and tasks in a project delivery um, program. It allows our consultant project manager to run the program with a close coordination of city staff. Um, in our current adopted budget um, and in our five-year plan, we anticipate spending over $18 million to address the inflow and infiltration in our sanitary sewer system. Uh, this program would allow us to efficiently and effectively deliver that program. Um, so our procurement process, um, the way we um, determined how we would procure the consultant services is based on both city and state procurement contracting rules. The dollar value of the contract identifies the need for a formal selection process. So any contract greater than $250,000 is required to utilize this process. Um, and so that requires a full request for proposals out um, to um, post it in the DJC. Um, and then we post that on our bid site. And then the, 
the way that the consultant is selected is based on qualifications. So we do not ask for pricing materials, and that is a requirement of the state. So the intention is to, to select the most qualified consultant, and then at that point negotiate the price for the, the work. Um, so that, that is uh, consistent with both the city's procurement policies and the state policies. So we, so we drafted our um, request for proposals with a intention of it being a four-year program, um, and that will, re, that will get through us through basins um, eight and five. Uh, this first 15-month pilot program, which I've brought uh, before you tonight, establishes what we would kind of call those front end or program management tasks. So getting a public outreach plan together, um, how we're gonna manage the program and those kind of administrative pieces. Um, but it also sets us up to have a more in-depth conversation with the commission about how do we handle the private sanitary sewer laterals on those um, on private property, um, as well as some downspouts that are um, cross-connected to our sanitary sewer system. Um, and then that front end work also addresses our rehabilitation guidelines and sets up a flow monitoring program so that we can determine how much of that flow in the pipes is um, not sewer system. So we can compare the flow that we find in the pipes to, to rain data and be able to determine how much of that we think we can remove um, with a project. Um, and then that request for proposals also um, includes all of the design and construction management services for the entire five-year program. And so tonight's um, uh, scope of work includes that first project, um, but it would ultimately include all of the design services. So the consultant selection process included a, um, a team of um, I think five staff members and we reviewed these. Um, there, it sounded like last time we shared this information with you, there was concern that we only received two proposals. I went back and looked, we had approximately 25 firms that pulled the documentation from our bidding site. Um, and really I think where, where this comes from is we requested a, a large team so that um, knowing that we're having $18 million worth of work, it didn't make sense for that to be one consultant. So we asked for them to have a team of subconsultants. And so each of those you know, individual firms pulled the proposal, kind of looked through it and started to um, reach out to counterparts and put together an appropriate team. Um, and so we got two teams that submitted. consisted of multiple consulting firms, so they were all sort of pooling and partnering with each, with each other. Okay. Yes, yeah, the intent is we didn't want all of this work going to one firm over those five years, so, so we asked that they include a, a, a broad team. So this visual, it's, it's a little confusing, but it shows you um, the, the, the breakdown of the group. Um, and so what you'll see kind of in that bottom right-hand corner is that Wallace Engineering as the prime would only deliver about 20% of um, the contract dollar value, and they would have multiple subs underneath them that would be um, completing different components. So in this, um, you know, this breakdown, Brown and Caldwell would be designing, you know, maybe project one and project two might be delivered by Keller and Associates. The survey work would be a consistent firm um, or two that would do that work. And then they've proposed one um, consulting firm that would do all of the inspection work. So they, that, that firm would do inspection on all of the projects out of this program. So the, the contract would not be awarding any construction contracts. That would be bid separately, um, as you typically see those come through. Um, I did include this time a slide that um, gives a little bit more of a breakdown on how we intend to spend that 1.4 million. Um, and so this is, again, a busy slide, but we have 11 tasks. Um, and I've listed the um, estimate for each of those tasks here. Um, the tasks with the asterisks are those tasks which would be considered 
part of that program management, um, which is about $400,000. And then the remaining million dollars um, for tasks six through 11 would be for the design and construction of project number one. And we don't know the exact details of project one, so we've made an assumption that it's about a $4.5 million project. So, Dana, who assigned those values to those tasks? The consultant did. Consultant did. All right. Um, so, again, this is that busy um, timeline slide. And I don't know, do I have a pointer? No, oh, it's not going to show. So, kind of in the middle of the screen. Where those, yep, where that red bar is, um, starts to show the design phase, and then the con through the construction phase of that first project. So the goal is within the first 15 months, we'll have our first project completed. We can start looking at um, post-construction flow monitoring to see how effective the project was, um, and at that time we would come back and present an annual report showing how effective the project was. Um, requesting an amendment to the contract with Wallace Engineering to move forward with what we would propose um, completing in that second year. And so right now we, we have a little bit of an idea what that would be, but as we work through the um, flow monitoring and the condition assessment, we'll have a better idea what each of those individual projects looks like. Um, again, it's a five-year um, program um, with an option to extend it. Um, to line up with the WES IGA for reimbursements. Um, and so as a reminder, we did um, approve the Water Environment Services IGA, which allows us up to 33% reimbursement for these projects. Um, I did present to the WES technical advisory team, and we did receive both um, the technical team approval and a, a formal letter from WES approving our first two projects for reimbursement. So that is this contract for INI program management and the Rivercrest phase three um, construction project, which is out to bid currently. So we would anticipate with this $18 million program and a 33% reimbursement, a savings of $6 million. And as we work through this program management, we'll um, come back and have discussions about do we, do we address private laterals? Um, the $6 million in savings could help um, with that program, or that money could be reinvested into another basin. And so those will be discussions we'll bring back in the future. Um, again, I mentioned the annual report. Um, part of the contract would include, um, you know, what progress we've made, how, how much I and I we've removed from the system, um, and then a request to continue the program for another year with a contract amendment. Questions? My right and left. None from me. Uh, is there a motion? Lots of silence here. I know you're losing your voice. Um, well, I guess I will support of this. I think that we need to do this. I know that the, the two most Commissioner McGriff is your mic. Two most affected neighborhoods are Rivercrest and the Malawa neighborhood, and I can't even imagine how much. Um, infiltration that we have because we probably only calculated a very small percentage of it there's probably more than we are aware of that's happening out there and i think we need to get this done i know that there were some questions regarding the contract amount but i think staff has come back with um adequate more than adequate documentation so you know it's a word to the wise do this the first time uh and we've gotten approval, which we didn't have the last time, of the uh, reimbursement. So I'm hoping that we will support this so we can move this forward. It needs to get done. Yeah, sorry, I was um, switching over to the staff report really oh, quickly. Right. I was checking something. Uh, but I will make a motion to uh, authorize the city manager to execute the personal services agreement with Wallace Engineering for the Inflow Infiltration Program Management, CI 21-015. 
Do I have a second? Well, I believe for purposes of a vote, I'll second it. Okay. Let's have some discussion because I know there's some reluctance. And I guess I'd like to know why we shouldn't be doing this. I know it's a lot of money, but it's just going to keep getting more and more expensive. And we got, you know, you, what was your statement earlier in our meeting about, uh, not this meeting, but our Urban Renewal Commission meeting about us needing to move forward uh, rather than backwards? I didn't get the quote exactly. I was trying to write it down as you were saying. It was, it was rather... It couldn't possibly have been that profound. It was very <laughs> profound. I made a note of it in my notebook. <laughs> I hate it when people use my own words against me. Go ahead. I'm sorry, my voice is not going well, but part of my hesitancy of supporting it is because of my concerns of Wes, which I've spoken about to no end. Um, I guess I want to know that the $6 million that they're reimbursing us is... Um, less than the amount we're saving them by doing this. Because if we're doing all this work as a city to invest in all this, what is the way to connect that and know that they're contributing a fair amount to projects that we're doing versus what other cities are doing? It does, I've never been able to see how that really matches up. And we will never know that. Um, that's been my concern Isn't all there along. there a way to request that? Information? <laughs> Good luck. You can request it all you want. You'll never get it. If I, Please. I could, you're right. That's a difficult um, number to try to tie any scientific measure because we'll never spend enough money trying to measure we're going to do a good job of trying to get pre and post um, dollar amounts but I think the key for this commission to understand is um, we need an INI program an INI reduction program we need it for yes the treatment plant but we have um, pipe networks downstream of this system that are our pipe networks and so not doing it means more water that those pipe networks have to convey. And when they're conveying full, you know, a full pipeline like that, especially the old pipelines like what we have, just makes them deteriorate that much more. They don't have great joints and, you know, they're cracked and those kind of things. So there's that. And then so much of what we're finding in the Rivercrest Basin is the pipelines that exist, the small diameter stuff, the stuff up in the neighborhoods, the, the, the kind of the end of the treatment system is so far beyond its um, design life that, you know, we just need to replace the pipelines because of their age. And the benefit to that is both new pipelines and um, sealing up those leaky pipelines. And that, so it's twofold for Oregon City, especially in these two basins. And um, so that, you know, it, it, is, is there a benefit? I think if there weren't, a, if, if there wasn't a benefit to the uh, treatment systems, then we probably wouldn't see the 33% payment from Wes. So they recognize it. How much, how they're conveying that, I think they're just trying to get agencies like Oregon City, Westland and Gladstone and Happy Valley to kind of, uh, See how good a job they can do so that maybe we can eliminate some treatment plant improvements in the long run that wouldn't be much more costly so <clears throat> that's the best I can give you I, I hear what you're saying I just I don't know that it's going to be easy for our program to measure that well I guess this is kind of a silly they, go ahead Rocky they can't even tell us how much is coming from each city they cannot even answer that question um, and we've asked that question for years. So, you know, 
how, how, how do the how how does the stuff come into the plant? I mean, is I know, I know this is going to sound crazy, but is there like a, a pipe that's that's the Oregon City pipe? There's the West Lynn pipe. There's the Happy Valley pipe. I don't know. I mean, is is that <laughs> no? How, how does it come? It's how all does concepts. the stuff come in? Yeah, does, we, we we do have separated. a um, what I would consider kind of a complicated collection system in that you know a lot of West Lynn's flows come across the river and tie into uh, interceptor pipes that are shared by Oregon City and uh, West Lynn. Okay. And then some of our interceptor pipes also have like the um, uh, manufactured home park off, out off Maple Lane. That, that's, that's all West, but it, we tie together. So yeah, there, there's, there are some complexities and some challenges because of that complexity to how you measure it and how you establish is this Westland flow or is this Oregon City flow? I think that's kind of what you're asking, isn't it? <laughs> well, that's what we've always been asking, and according to Wes, it's West flow. So they don't care where it's coming from. It saves their ratepayers. Whether it saves our ratepayers in our city the same amount or similar amounts as other cities has been the question from for the last decade. Well, there seems to me there there ought to be a way to mathematically project the amount from this date versus a future date. I mean... Well, that's where the flow monitoring and some of the, you know, this goes back to our master planning right. before we did uh, the moratorium projects where, you know, we weren't so focused on the treatment plant. We were pretty focused on our own collection system. And what we found was the benefit of spending dollars. Uh, we, we, we went ahead and made the decision because we were having overflows in, up, in, up in our um, collection system. So we addressed those as moratorium projects, but we only built those pipes. Uh, we built those pipes big enough, assuming we were going to have an aggressive I&I program. And that's where this program came into play. The, the, um, West uh, um, contribution is is a relatively new idea. It was something that I'd always hoped for because my hope was they were either going to reduce their rates or come up with some kind of a reimbursement program. And so, 33 percent to me has has always been um, it, it it's more than what I've seen from other other jurisdictions. Let's just put it that way. Mr. O'Donnell. Those are the very questions that Commissioner Smith is asking. I mean, one of the impacts of an INI program is to reduce the amount of water that has to be processed by Wes. And if you work backward, he's, you know, the first question you ask is, what is the financial benefit to Wes? And or should we, quite honestly, should we be getting more? Because we are contributing more, or are we subsidizing other players in the mix? And then you work backward from that. It's like, well, we can't tell you because the water is commingled and we don't know what's yours and what's somebody else's. And that's the game that's been going on forever. And I understand his frustrations and that's why I hesitate always to get in bed with these folks. Do I understand 33% is still 6 million? Yeah, I get that. Do I like it? No, is it, you touched on something. Is there any future relief to ratepayers? You don't see anything stated that, that it'll be examined. And if we process 30% less effluent that you're going to get a reduction in your rate. You don't see those things from these people. Right. And every, every time we sign another agreement with them, right. it's less and less likely. We should have never signed the first agreement with them. Well, we shouldn't have signed the last one with them. One element um, that I, we haven't so, really anyway. considered, but as I'm hearing this, uh, you know, we've got in this scope, part of the management program is to come up with um, a recommendation for flow monitoring. Now, Oregon City could take places where it makes sense within Oregon City system to, um, you know, build a flow, a permanent flow monitoring system that would do a lot more to inform that question. And if that was the commission's kind of direction, we can bring as a part of this project, we can ask our consultant team to look at that idea as to, hey, we, what we're hearing from the commission is they want much more accurate information about how much uh, reduction or how much contribution the city has to this West system. And if that's what we're hearing from you, I, I don't have any problem adjusting our scope of 
enough to ask them to do that so that we establish a permanent flow monitoring system or at least something that gets us through this six-year period so that we can, you know, speak directly to Wes about, hey, here's what we really accomplish and we've got a high level of confidence in that. and if that's what the commission would like we're happy to bring that back i, I just i, I just think that like would be a great idea we wouldn't be able to do that without this contract right i think that would be an excellent idea because i think we would have some numbers to come back to wes and since i'm going to be soon joining their merry band of people uh, i think that's something that we would be helping future commissions have the answer to that question. Plus, it would help inform our, pre you know, our putting pressure on them. And you know, I, I don't, I don't have any problem in going into their meetings and, and being, you know, a pain in the ass. So, <laughs> well, I'm, well, without getting too far into this, I know. there was a reason that I was on that um, yes. advisory. Yes. If the commissions of the past and current. Don't choose to listen to advice from someone that knows where we've been in the last 10 years. Then there's no need for me to be on that committee. And here we are. This commission approved an IGA again. Despite what I've warned, despite what I've said, despite my last 20 years of knowledge on but, this topic. But Rocky, and that's how, do we help, how do we help our community? Well, we, we can't detach we, knew, we can't detach ourselves from Wes. I mean, you know, if we can figure out we can't. Well, yeah, I mean we I, I don't think we're I don't think we're uh, building our own treatment plans in our future. So it's in your hands. I've what? given enough input over the years. We're not gonna get the answers we want. It doesn't matter if we can show our flow to them without comparing it with the flows to the other cities. Well they'll it doesn't do us a whole lot of good. They'll know their total gallons processed. Yes. And we'll know what we have. And at that point, we would know if you, this measuring device you talk about would allow us to say our contribution, if you're processing 100,000 gallons a day, our contribution is 50 or 40, which we now cannot say. Now, we're locked into this for the moment because this commission voted to do it, right? We're locked into what? We're locked into this agreement with Wes. Uh, well, I'm... We can back out of it if we don't want this 33 percent. Well, the that question is, you're not going to you're not going to bring on this project you described in, in months. It'll take a long time, and right. you need the funding to do it. You're saying the source of funding will be this 33 percent to well, allow you to construct a measurement device, right? I'm saying we've got a, we've got a flow monitoring program management item in our scope of work. We can direct that a lot more pointedly that says, look, not only do we want to know what our flows are pre and post the I and I program work that we're planning, but we want to incorporate something that, that is going to look really at the end of pipe, at the end of Oregon City's pipe. And that's, that's not just one pipe, by the way, that's multiple pipes. So let's come up with a system that measures that accurately, gives us data, and then uh, again, that may be year one, but we're going to have to collect data. And that after. data will allow us to engage in a future discussion right. with them about right. yes. our contribution. We're getting charged more than we're contributing. Yeah. Right. Because we'll have the facts. Yeah. Now, the question is, and I don't expect you to be able to answer it, we don't know the, the cost of that project, and we don't know the timeline to deliver that project. The source of funding of that project, you're saying, may be part of this 33% reimbursement is that correct that's correct okay the other two questions we can't answer sitting here tonight right i mean flow monitoring is no doubt a standard and the, the quality and the level of that we haven't discussed that with west but we could say hey we want we, we want the cadillac when it comes to flow monitoring and that there's no reason why that shouldn't be okay. part of our program so at what point in time assuming we gathered that information could we reopen those negotiations with west Say we got that information and we make a determination what our effluent contribution is. At what point, if we have those numbers, are, are we in a position with them to say, to reopen negotiations, say, hey, we should be getting this amount for these projects, 40% or 45 or 50? Well, I'm confident we can get base information within a year. That's good. And I would say that base information, you know, this, this tends to be a little bit, well, I'm getting in the weeds, but it's weather related. So if we get good good rain, 
okay. weather patterns over a couple of years, we're going to have some really good history. And, oh. and I think Wes would be happy to see that information and happy to discuss it. What, you know, whether that changed their formulas, I don't know. But we can definitely be more informed sure, about what we're really accomplishing. If we succeed in gathering those numbers, is that arrangement with Wes subject to renegotiation? The, the 33%? Because I don't know. It's the same IG with every other entity, yeah, so it, they're not going to change yeah. it. They, they're well, applying the same IGA. We might be different. Board. That which you can't measure, you can't control. You're giving us a means to measure it. That's, That's I right. Think has value. I, I yeah, can't predict I agree. how effective we can use that to renegotiate, but we would at least have the data. Yeah, I would agree. To talk to them about the fact yeah, that... Talk about that, re that increase in their contribution or rate reduction to our rate payers. But you can't do that in the absence of data. Right. We right. need information. And I'm with I'm with Commissioner Smith. I do not love dealing with these folks for the very reason he states. But I gotta get I gotta get a starting point. Yep, we're at a we're at a starting right. point. So I think we've you've heard that we want to add that. Okay. Give us give us some facts that we can go and say, here you go. Make it they're not gonna be able to refute that. So all right, are we ready for the question? Sure. All right, let's call for the question. We have the motion by Commissioner Morrill and a second by Commissioner O'Donnell, correct? Yes. Okay. All right. Commissioner Rocky Smith? No. Commissioner Adam Morrill? Aye. Commissioner Frank O'Donnell? Aye, for the reasons stated. And Commission President Denise McCray? Aye. Motion passes. All right. We're going to hold somebody's feet to the fire. Um, before, I for, before I forget this between items 9A and 9B, I believe that um, our uh, esteemed pilot, Mr. Williams, has some cards that he was going to give to the commission, so I don't want us to get away without having that happen. <laughs> and I believe there was a special request by some of our staff that we want to reward them with this. I'm glad that yes. Diaz is this high for, for security purposes when approaching. He doesn't have his lightsaber with him, so we're I, safe. I'm unarmed at this time. He's unarmed. Coming we're up. safe. So, so yes, thank you, uh, Commissioner President Maker, if you're correct. So as part of our festivities today for May the 4th, we had special Baby Yoda library cards that are now available. So I have one for each of the commissioners. Uh, I will let you know that these are not active yet. If you would like to have them activated, just send me an email and we will get them activated for you. But at least you have a souvenir Baby Yoda cards. These were very popular tonight. Uh, we had uh, uh, Aquila Her Graphic got, uh, came in and, and got one. So. Not to put you on the spot, but pretty cool, right? Yes, Did we have one cool. for the city manager? Uh, we definitely have one for Tony. I did not bring it today. Uh, we don't want to. We have one, for, and I would encourage anybody out there in the community, if you have a library card, you can come and get an upgraded Baby Yoda card. If you don't have a library card, it's a great time to come to the library and get one. It's the best card you can have in your wallet. <laughs> when will the uh, Mandalorian holding the Baby Yoda cards come for? <laughs> we'll, we'll try that next year. We'll see. Uh, these were so popular. We'll see what we can do next year. Might have a revolt. It's Grogu. Right. It's, it's, yes, it is. It is Grogu, but Baby Yoda is just. So I know. Cute. Well, I'll, I'll take oh. one of those. I don't. I don't want the other one. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, we have um, 9B, second reading of ordinance number 22-1002. Uh, did you want to add anything to this, Mr. Reed? Or is it goes without saying? It's just, let's do it. Thanks, Greg. Appreciate it. All right, do we have a motion to uh, have a second reading? We're all enamored with our baby Yoda. <laughs> Everybody's in a trance now. I move to approve the second reading of ordinance number 22-1002. Second. <laughs> all right, it's been moved and seconded for the second reading. Mr. Kabaisman. Uh, thank you. Ordinance number 22-1002, an ordinance of the City of Oregon City incorporating the Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee as part of the city code. Commissioner Rocky Smith. Aye. Commissioner Adam Morrow. Aye. Commissioner Frank O'Donnell. Aye. Commissioner President Denise McGriff. Aye. So Motion now we have this committee in line with everybody else and go forth and continue to do good things, Mr. Reed, because now you are officially in charge according to this new, new, new ordinance. 
All right, so we have communications. Mr. Conkle, sir. I have no communications tonight, thank you. None from me. My fellow commissioners. Talked out. Talked out. I would just remind folks in the community to remember to, uh, when they are voting, to go to the end of their ballot, where they will see three ballot measures that have been referred by us. Um, and please do your research. Thank you, Mr. Morrow. That's very timely. Um, I just have one um, comment that I wanted to make. So I want to make sure, my fellow commissioners, um, that you and that you are aware that if you have concerns regarding an agenda item that's coming up uh, at any future meeting, that please contact the city manager and the department head with your concerns ahead of time. I um, would strongly urge you that I don't. Um, I don't want us to be surprising our staff. I used a different word, but I toned it down. Um, I personally follow that practice. I try to let staff know uh, ahead of time. Sometimes it might be two hours before the meeting, but I say, hey, by the way, I finally read this. Uh, were you aware of X, Y, or Z? Uh, it's courteous, as I've stated to members of the public. Uh, when I was staff, I did not like this happening to me, and I don't want to see it happen to our staff. So I would just ask you to please take that into consideration in future. So other than that, if there's no other announcements or Mrs. Chief, anything exciting besides we had a truck lock its brakes on Singer Hill this afternoon and caused the traffic to back up. <laughs> I'm not jinxing it. <laughs> I did want to add that um, this afternoon I had the opportunity to participate with uh, Commission Chair Tootie Smith, uh, Mayor um, Jules Walter, Metro Councilor Christine Lewis. I have to go in my head and think of everybody who was there. Uh, myself and Congressman Schrader, he presented a check to uh, uh, Willamette Falls Locks Commission Chair Tootie Smith, who then passed it over to the Colonel from the Corps to get the work started on the Willamette Falls Locks. And uh, that was exciting to see and uh, know that that has been a long time in coming. So now the authority has a little bit of money to work with. Um, I'm sure that they're going to find it's going to cost a lot more than what they think, but um, we'll continue to work on that. But uh, it was nice to see everybody out there. I hadn't seen some of these people for two years, and it's nice not seeing them like this on a little, you know, the Hollywood squares. So being no further business, we will adjourn to our, uh, we'll take how much of a break do you want? Five minutes? Okay, five minutes, and then we will uh, proceed with our executive session. Thank you.